Hello. After the joy and excitement and the visual humour of the French scene, we have a scene which is almost a direct contrast. And it's a scene that can perhaps be uh, encapsulated through the rather uh, provocative word, foreskins. Let's take a look at the scene. So, this is Erwin's first lesson with the boys. And ultimately, it's an exercise in the teacher asserting his authority over the students. And the students being distinctly unimpressed. And as we watch it, we see their unimpressed nature through the body language and the facial expressions. There are arms folded, there are sort of concerned or with sneering faces. Um, let's uh, look at the scene in a little bit more detail. Not too much, but just a little bit. Erwin distributes the exercise books, but in most versions it's him kind of chucking the books at the students. Dull, dull, abysmally dull. A triumph, the dullest of the lot. I got all the points, I didn't say it was wrong. I said it was dull. Why is it underlined? Because that embodies, that typifies, that symbolizes, that represents Owen's teaching philosophy. It's not about knowing the facts, it's about the presentation of the facts that matters. And that's why the word foreskins um, is, is one that I think is useful for the scene. There's an awful lot of words going on here as uh, the students get into a sort of tete-a-tete, -tete, French phrase meaning head-to-head -head with the teacher. Um, they are testing him like students do at the beginning of most academic years really. Uh, what can I get away with with this, this guy or this, this woman? Um, are we allowed to make jokes? Where's the line? Uh, at what stage will the teacher draw this kind of banter, yeah. horrible word banter, but when will they draw it to a close? Are they able to deal with it? Can they respond in kind with wit or anger or you know, what is it? Erwin responds by trying to dazzle them with his philosophy, which ultimately is represented through this. He regards them for a moment or two in silence. And while he's doing that, he's pondering. What's the best way? What's the best way to get these boys on site? And this is his mechanism. At the time of the Reformation, there were 14 foreskins of Christ preserved, but it was thought that the Church of St. John Lateran in Rome had the authentic profuse. Don't think we're shocked by your mention of the word foreskin, sir. No, sir. Some of these even have them. Not Posner, though, sir. Posner's like, you know, Jewish. It's one of several things Posner doesn't have. Right. There's, a, there's really a lot going on here. Erwin tries to dazzle them with this knowledge, which is ultimately presentation. Um, it's not the kind of things that kind of thing, sorry, that teachers usually teach because it is provocative and dangerous. Uh, it opens teachers up to having to answer difficult questions potentially. But Dakin responds by saying, well, you know, don't think we're bothered by what you've just said. Not a big deal. And then they turn it into a joke. So this idea of the foreskin represents Erwin's teaching philosophy because it's extraneous useless knowledge. It's a bit of presentation. Um, at the risk of being a little bit vulgar, arguably that's what a foreskin is. Um, it doesn't really do very much. Um, it's just kind of there. Uh, and, and then the boys turn that into a bit of a joke. You know, some of them have got it and some of them have don't and some of them don't. Um, and again, the reference to Posner's uh, religion, is that his being Jewish, is again provocative. Can they test this teacher? Is he going to shut them down? Does he view this as unacceptable or 
politically incorrect. Where's that line, that mythical line that, that students somehow know about? Um, what is acceptable? How much can you get away with uh, with a teacher? Now, the way that they hedge much of those provocative statements is through the repetition of this word here. Because by using and repeating the word sir, it creates the impression that these boys are being respectful, that they are being deferential. But make no mistake, this is an exercise in challenge. As they then proceed, it becomes an exercise, to use that phrase again, in showing off. Ostentatious, to be ostentatious is to flashily, showily reveal what you can do. And that's what Lockwood and Crowther do. Um, that's not racist though, sir, isn't it? It's race related, but it's not racist. But look how clever we are. Another pause while Erwin regards the class. It's actually quite unusual to pause for a great length of time. And I just did it there on purpose, at, on a video, no less. So I'll look back and I'm sure I'll be embarrassed. And then I stared into the camera because silence makes people uncomfortable. You might have thought that the video had broken, but silence makes people uncomfortable. Um, Irwin's being silent there, his pausing, shows a, 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 an element of confidence, really. Um, but it's about him thinking of a way to reassert himself. How does he do that? Has anyone been to Rome? No, well, you're up against people who have, and they will know these kind of tiny details. They will know when they come to do an essay like this on the church on the eve of the Reformation that some silly nonsense on the foreskins of Christ will come in handy so that it is their essay, so that their essays, unlike yours, will not be dull. Think board examiners, think 60, think 160 papers even more competent than the last, so that the 14 foreskins of Christ will come as a real ray of sunshine come the 14 foreskins of Christ and they'll think they've won the pools. Now you'll notice here that I have written the phrase, it is a gobbit. Uh, and this is significant because you may remember later in the text, Hector rejects the, the concept of a gobbit, uh, a handy little quotation, a dinky little formula just trotted out to impress an examiner. Hector doesn't think that that's what education should be. Owen does Maybe he's just a pragmatist. I know that if I'm marking many, many papers, that students who do say something a little bit different, a bit unique, they, they do become memorable. So is Erwin merely just being realistic and practical? Is this not what good teaching is? And that's where you come in to decide, well, which, which do you want? Which do you prefer as a student? Do you want teachers who value their, the knowledge for its own sake? Uh, or do you want them to help you get through an exam? Hopefully there's a bit of both involved. Now that note there is uh, to explain something earlier about the skin. Maybe the reason I'm also showing you is because there are cultural references here to the 1980s. What are the pools? Well, the pools was something typically done by many families. Um, if you won the pools, you might win 30, 40, 50,000 pounds. It's like, it was like a lottery of its time, really. I think the pools still exist, but people don't tend to play them very much because there are other means, you know, the lottery, as I said, or postcode, people's lottery, whatever else. Erwin pauses. He says that they should hate these other boys and girls because they have been groomed. And it, what he's doing here is talking about class. Some people have just been groomed to go to Oxbridge. It's in their DNA almost. They are like thoroughbreds for this one particular race. He says you might as well, you don't have any hope. Sometimes teachers, people, managers, whoever, um, will try to motivate uh, whoever is in their charge, whoever they are in charge of. Um, and they may do this through the carrot 
or the stick. The carrot is praise, encouragement. The stick is, you know, a, a bit of a telling off. And it comes from the concept of a, you know, a jockey on a horse uh, or an animal. Do you give it a carrot, say, well done, here you are, run, run, run. Or do you give it a, a, a bit of a whipping with a stick, make it run? In this instance, Erwin employs the stick, the metaphorical stick. Crowther asks, why are we bothering? He says, I don't know. You want it, I imagine. Or your parents want it. Headmaster, he certainly wants it. But I wouldn't waste the money. Judging by these, point. go to Newcastle and be happy. And uh, in most of the versions, that's the way Erwin says it. Happiness is an insult. Happiness is, is not success. Um, go to Newcastle and settle. Of course, there is another way. Cheat. And Erwin doesn't say no. I'd like to think that if a student asked me whether they should cheat in an exam, I'd like to think I'd say no. I'd like to think that I and the people who I work with would all say no because it would be the moral, the correct, the right thing to do. Erwin, however, is amoral. And this arguably links back to the beginning of the text. Let's take a quick look. Because what was Erwin at the beginning of the text? He was a governmental spin doctor advising MPs, advising them on how paradox mists up the windows. The loss of liberty is the price we pay for freedom. The loss of freedom is the price we pay for freedom. You can pull the wool over people's eyes. You can trick them. You can deceive them by sounding clever. And that's what Erwin wants to do now. He wants to deceive, encourage these boys to deceive others in the way that they go about exams. And as I found my page uh, once more, here we are. Um, that typifies his philosophy. The boys aren't terribly impressed. The bell rings. Tim calls him a wanker. Um, and I, like, I love this line. They all have to do it, don't they? Teachers, you know, they all have to do it. Show you they're still the game. Foreskins and stuff. Oh, sir, you devil. Oh, look. It's like the teacher who swears, the teacher who tells jokes, the teacher who tries to be friends with the students is the teacher who is still in the game. And Dakin here is suggesting that students don't have a great deal of respect for that, that approach. Scripps, oh, he's only a bit older than us. And then we have this strange digression. What happened with Hector on the bike? And as the audience were like, what? What, what, what do you mean? Why would anything happen? Now we're playing catch up as the audience. What's going on? What does, what does he mean? As per, same as usual. Except I managed to get my bag down. I think he thought he'd got me going. In fact, it was my Tudor Economic Documents, volume two. What on earth is he talking about? Well, on the stage, what we see him do is hold up a particularly thick book, you know, a book that would be three times the size of, size of this, a hardback book with a sort of, yeah, a hard cover, very large. So what's going on on the bike? Scripp says, I think he thought he'd got me going that there was this hardback book in the world. No, we don't really know what he's talking about, but there are clues being laid that Hector um, may be abusing the position of power that he holds. After all, why is it that these boys are even getting on a bike with Hector in the first place? Posner comes along. <clears throat> And what we have here with these sections, Posner and Scripps, is again, they stop talking to each other, you know, person over here and another person here, and they address the audience, they address the people in the crowd, just like I'm doing to you uh, on, a, on a video in this instance. 
and we have sort of narrative intrusion where Posner gives us his innermost thoughts. He says, he says, because I was late growing up, because I'm a late developer, I'm not included in this kind of conversation. I'm not supposed to understand. Actually, they would be surprised how much I know about them and their bodies and everything else. What I'm pointing towards on the screen there tells, it says what it says really, the answer, so to speak. Scripps also addresses the audience. Dakin's navel, I remember, was small and hard like an unripe blackberry. Posner's navel was softer and more like that of the eponymous orange. Posner envied Dakin his navel and all the rest of him. That this envy might amount to love does not yet occur to Posner, as to date it has only caused him misery and dissatisfaction. We've just been told, in case we hadn't got it, that Posner admired, you know, he loves Dakin. That's it. And that's what makes Posner an unhappy boy. Then they go back on with their conversation. I wish sometimes he'd just go for it. Posner? <sighs> Hector. He does go for it. That's the trouble. Yeah, in controlled conditions. Not on the fucking bike. I'm terrified. Of the sex? No. The next roundabout. Raj is having sex, apparently. Rudge comes along again, addresses the audience only on Fridays. He's a bit sort of more um, accented. That's the sort of way that um, his supposedly less intelligent status is conveyed. I need the weekend free for rugger and golf. Nobody thinks I have a hope in this exam. Fuck them. Currently, I'm seeing Fiona, the headmaster's secretary. Not that he knows. We haven't done it yet. But when we do, I'm hoping one of the times might be on his study floor. Shit. It's like the headmaster says. One should have targets. Now, if you're watching this video and, you, and you're sort of surprised or um, concerned by some of the language, well, the exam board choose it partly because it's a text about schools, it's a text about teachers, it's a, and therefore it's a text about real life. Um, 17 and 18 year old boys are preoccupied with sex. That's a stereotype, of course, but many of them are. Um, and so that they talk about sex and girls and school uh, in such an open way really is I, I suppose just reflective of life in some respects um, and the same thing applies to the swearing um, we shouldn't be too prudish about it because it's not uncommon to hear teenagers swear uh, particularly when they're talking amongst friends and that's what they're doing in this particular um, bit of the text in terms of going back to the text, what we should now see uh, is, uh, well, one or two things. Rudge. Rudge may be intellectually inferior because of his supposedly being less intelligent, but socially he is superior because he's already having sex with girls and that's what the other boys want to do. So Rudge has a high status amongst the group because of his social proclivities, his social success. Dakin, the handsome boy that we were told about at the beginning of the text, um, has a high status because he is handsome, but he's also kind of rebellious because he's data, dating the headmaster's secretary. Um, I don't think head, uh, Fiona is meant to be a sort of middle-aged woman. I think in most of the productions, she's in, you know, a younger woman in her 20s. But knowing Fiona and um, who she is, the headmaster's secretary, will give Dakin power because the headmaster's secretary will be privy to, will be aware of, is what that means, kind of gossip, important information with regards to a school and the headmaster. And if she passes that on to Dakin, which she will do, it becomes a lever uh, of power later in the text. And that's it for this particular scene. Um, a reasonably long one. What does it focus on? Erwin's teaching philosophy, how it's presentation that matters. The boys being initially uncertain and actually plain dismissive of Erwin. Uh, and then the segue into the discussion of the boys' social lives. And that's it for this particular video. Uh, hope it's useful. That's it. Bye for now.